Thank you, Monica, for the opportunity to share my work um, on childhood obesity and also my nonprofit called Faithful to Fitness. Uh, what I'll be presenting today is um, lots of work uh, that I've done with the community, with the um, healthcare organizations, uh, workers, medical students uh, over about 10 years. And I hope that not only will I provide knowledge, but I will also provide motivation and inspiration for everybody who is listening and watching today. So, um, <clears throat> see here. Can't see slides. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes. So I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. And some of the objectives I have here is to discuss how healthcare workers and community organizations can together make a difference in the childhood obesity epidemic in America, to discuss the collaboration of my nonprofit, Faithful to Fitness, with community partners to create a childhood obesity intervention program here in Rockford, Illinois, and this can be replicated anywhere in the U.S. So just to start with a few um, definitions, so in terms of definitions of childhood overweight and obesity um, for the censuses of disease control and prevention, um, overweight and obesity is defined as abnormal or excessive fat accumulation that may impair health. So even though body mass index or BMI does not directly measure fat, but it's a reasonable indicator of body fatness for most children and teens. Now um, for overweight definition, for children, BMI at or above the 85th percentile, but lower than the 95th percentile for children of the same age and sex is defined as overweight. And obesity, uh, BMI at or above the 95th percentile for children of the same age and sex. Some facts about childhood obesity per CDC report in 2014. Uh, for age group 6 to 11 years, obesity increased from 7% in 1980 to 18% in 2012. And age 12 to 19 years, obesity increased from 5% in 1980 to 21% in 2012. In 2012, um, more than a third of children and adolescents were overweight or obese. In the CDC report from data collected 2017 to 2020, um, age group two to five years, um, the, the um, obesity rate was 12.7%, six to 11 years at 20.7%, and 12 to 19 years at 22.2%. So over the past 30 years, obesity has doubled in children and tripled in adolescents. The National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey 2017 to 2018 reported for age group two to 19 years, one in six children are overweight and one in five children have obesity. And just as a kind of a glance in the, the Forbes Health article published in June of 2023 showed that four in 10 Americans are affected by obesity based on CDC data. And the obesity rate in the US increased from by 3% from March 2020 to March 2021. It also showed that obesity tripled the risk of hospitalization from COVID-19. Obesity is linked to 30 to 53% of newly diagnosed diabetes, type two diabetes cases each year in the US. 30 to 40% higher healthcare costs is associated for, with patients who are obese. Data from 2017, to 2020 showed that 41.9% of adults in the U.S. are obese. 19 states have adult obesity rates that exceed 35%. And in 2022, the state of obesity report showed that for Black adults, 49.9% um, obesity rates, Hispanic adults, 45.6%, for white adults, 41.4%, and for Asian adults, 16.1%. They also showed in the um, article in Forbes Health, June of this year, that adults living in rural areas are more likely to have obesity than those living in urban areas. The healthcare costs related to obesity in the U.S. is estimated costs, including inpatient and outpatient prescription drugs, 
260.6 billion per year. And for adults with obesity, they spend over um, $1,800 more per year than someone who is not obese. So when I was beginning my work on childhood obesity, looking at um, CDC data and commentary um, showed for childhood obesity, the association and increased risk of cardiovascular disease with obesity, increased risk for type two diabetes, breathing problems um, like exacerbation of asthma, sleep apnea, joint problems, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. There's also a greater risk of social and psychological problems such as social anxiety and bullying. Um, why I talk about and work on childhood obese in intervention is that obese children are more likely to become obese adults. And adult obesity increases the risk of heart disease, diabetes, and some types of cancer, such as it's been reported there's a 30% higher risk of colon cancer for adults who are obese, and 87% higher risk of liver cancer, especially non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Some factors that have contributed to obesity, according to the Food Research and Action Center. So excess caloric intake, including sugar, sweetened beverages, frequent snacking, larger portion sizes, a higher caloric density of foods, more foods are consumed or purchased away from the home. There's also a lot of advertising that promotes unhealthy food consumption, uh, value sizing of less nutritious foods. These are things we've seen uh, personally. There's also an association of inadequate amounts of physical activity. Um, although technology is great and it's labor saving, but for example, the techn technological advances like computers does contribute to decreased physical activity, uh, increased screen time, media use, like TV, video games, our reliance on motorized transportation, um, limited access to safe and convenient recreational facilities or walking area, green space, for instance, limited opportunities for physical activity during the workday, um, and then for many children um, that have seen me, they also report limited daily physical education and recess in schools. So often recess has been replaced by other types of uh, activities at school and other classes. So some barriers that I've observed in the last 10 years um, that affect the prevention and treatment of obesity, especially in children, is that we have to view obesity as a medical problem. If we have an attitude that it's not a medical problem, it's hard to address something we can't admit to uh, a struggle. Um, other barriers, which is knowledge, knowledge of healthy food, uh, physical activity, screen time, the time that it takes that's dedicated to meal prepping and being active together as a family, and then access to you know, a green space and safety areas for physical activity together, access to healthy food, uh, fruits and vegetables. Um, the, for, as, far as far as a financial uh, barrier, sometimes the perception of eating healthier being more expensive and being in the right environment where you are motivated, being surrounded by other people who motivate you towards a healthier lifestyle as well, and just personal motivation to making healthy changes. Um, there's a movie called Patch Adams that came out on December 25th, 1998, and it's the um, story of Dr. Hunter Patch Adams, who I had the opportunity to meet in 2014 here in Rockford, Illinois. And a couple of quotes from attributed to Dr. Adams, which have inspired me during my medical career and also in formation of Vapor Fitness. So Dr. Adams has said that if you treat a disease, you win, you lose. If you treat a person, I guarantee you, you'll win no matter what the outcome. Our job is improving the quality of life, not just delaying death. <clears throat> the other thing that I've encountered in my work with um, as a pediatric GI, helping children who struggle with obesity-related health problems and also in my work in my nonprofit is how they come to us feeling hopeless, very overwhelmed and helpless. And so I always say to my patients and to people who come to me in my nonprofit work, 
is if you're overwhelmed, think of one thing you want to start with changing. So if you change nothing, nothing will change. So pick something to change. Although I talked today about my work with childhood obesity, my passion for obesity intervention started as a resident in the, my, um, my med peds training. And as an intern, I recall um, a patient in my first year of um, med peds residency in one of the early clinics in med peds clinic. Patient in Columbia, Missouri, her name was Deborah. She was 40 years old. She was a new patient to me and it was a, she was my last patient of the day. She had been discharged from the hospital after having a heart attack. She had a stent, uh, one stent that was placed. She weighed 386 pounds. She had type two diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, heart disease, obstructive sleep apnea, lots of back and knee pain, reflux and asthma on multiple medications. She was also a smoker for many years and reported a, as um, domestic violence history. Um, she lived in a shelter for a short time and also suffered from depression. And I spent over an hour with her trying to sort through all of her health issues. So we decided that of all the things that I obtained from her history, where can we start? So we started with quitting smoking. And it wasn't something that happened the next day. It was one cigarette at a time. And that's how I said, if you can't quit smoking, a lot of other things that are going on aren't going to get better. And then until she could really quit smoking, we worked on the diet, on physical activity. And eventually, after three years, um, about a week or two before I was leaving for my pediatric GI fellowship, she came to the office and she brought her pair of pants that she had when she first saw me and how many sizes that she had gone down. Not only that, she had lost 186 pounds over the three-year period. And all of that was just meeting me every few months and having motivation and starting with small changes at a time. And she told me that, I know you're going to PSGI, but I want you to remember this and don't forget me. And she's made a great impression on my journey of fighting childhood obesity and helping parents as well in the journey. So um, I did my fellowship from 2006 to 2009 in New York. And once I finished, I went to Augusta, Georgia. And in the process of my work there, I learned about a pediatric GI doctor named Dr. Marion Voss, who was at Emory. And my nurse practitioner showed, showed me a book that she had written called The No Diet Obesity Solution for Kids. And within this book, um, there's a healthy habits questionnaire broken down to questions related to physical activity, beverages, and eating. And these are just examples of the questions that were used. And this questionnaire is actually given to the patient and they fill it out while they're in the waiting room. And they have multiple choices to choose from and they get scored for each answer that they're given. And this is kind of one way for the patient to give us a history uh, without us directly asking them in the office to get time to think about it ahead of time. So for instance, how often does your child walk or ride a bike for pleasure and necessity? How often does your child engage in physical activity for 20 to 30 minutes or more at a time? How many hours of screen time does your child have in an average day? Where's the TV in your home? Beverages, the number of sugar-sweetened beverages. How many of those does your child usually consume per day? How about artificially sweetened beverages, you know, that are consumed by your child per day? And how many cups of plain water does your child usually drink per day? And as far as eating, eating habits, as far as breakfast consumption, eating at a table with one or more parents, serving at least one vegetable with a meal, how many times do we eat at a restaurant or bringing prepared food home, and how, um, where does your child eat the meals or snacks at home? Is the TV on when we're eating, you know, in terms of mindless eating, not recognizing how much we're eating? So these are some questions that I've actually implemented in the clinical practice and given it to other PGI doctors. And they found it very helpful because sometimes we don't know where to start to take a good history when we're trying to address this health issue. So when I was in Georgia from 2000, August 2009 to May 2013, um, a lot of my partners there were trying to figure out how can we 
have a clinic for childhood obesity. And it was a challenge in terms of, you know, finding uh, other doctors to work together and getting it covered through insurance and having families feel like they want to come to the clinic and be weighed and talk about specifically just this. So it was a lot of challenges. So I decided during that time that if we weren't really want to make a difference, uh, does it really matter? We get paid at that point, you know, just to make a difference. So I talked to community partners and I started the first childhood obesity intervention pr program in Augusta. Uh, and during that time, um, from September 2012 until May of 2013, we had this program. And I worked with residents who were interested um, in helping out medical students that were interested in volunteering, dietitians, and other people in the community and businesses. And during that program, we um, basically enrolled children who were overweight, obese, or had a family history of obesity, and they were referred by their primary care physician. It was a 12-week program. We enrolled between 10 to 20 children per program. We required parents and guardians to attend all classes. Uh, just down the street from the hospital, there was a Salvation Army Croc Center that had been built. And they donated a one hour weekly gym space and a fitness instructor to help us with the program. We had physicians, medical students, nurses, even dietitians that came out and exercised with the participants. Dietitians and dietetic interns also helped with nutrition education, such as uh, reviewing three day calorie counts or having families bring in um, like foods, snacks that or, or uh, beverages that they would consume and we would teach them about reading uh, labels. And we also held freezer meal workshops, cooking classes with a chef named Edward Mendoza and um, reps from a company called Wild Tree who provided spices and ingredients to help families prepare freezer meals. We were partnered with Kroger and Earth Fair grocery stores who donated gift cards and groceries so that we could use it for our cooking classes. And weight wasn't the focus, like where the child got weight every week. If they were interested, we had to wait at the beginning and at the end so that they would have an idea of the progress that they've made. We also, during that time, um, I had a, a resident who was interested in pediatric GI fellowship. And he wanted to work on kind of a grant or project with relation to this obesity program. So we applied for a CATCH grant, it's Community Access to Child Health through the American Academy of Pediatrics. And I had experience because I had received an AAP CATCH grant as a resident. So I kind of knew how to write the grant and I helped him with it. So um, for the grant, we had 93 children that were referred to our program between September 2012 and June 2013. 61 of the children that were referred and their families agreed to participate in the program. Uh, 36 were aged 6 to 10 years, 25 were aged 11 to 18 years. And the ethnic makeup, 75% Black children, 25% were white children, and 75% of the participants were on Medicaid. Although we were awarded $3,000 from the grant, but with the budgeting and everything, we returned most of the money to the AP because we found out that community partnerships were able to off offset a lot of the anticipated costs. And I think it shows here that it doesn't cost millions of dollars to make a difference. If it's important, we'll find a way and we'll find partners and people that are passionate to help us make it happen. So we uh, wanted to share here that in the first 12-week program, we noticed that all parents lost four pounds and children lost between four to 20 pounds. And we also had a, uh, a child in the program. His name is Derek. He was 12 years old. And they actually drove two hours from Savannah, Georgia to Augusta every Saturday because mom was like determined, this is it. This is the program that's going to make a difference. So he was 280 pounds at the beginning. And over the nine-month period from the time he started our program, after nine months, he had lost 45 pounds. He started out not walking a block. And he finished a 5K at the end of 12 weeks. He had been on medications for reflux and constipation. And he got off of those meds over a nine-month period. And over that nine-month time, he had no ER visits for asthma. So... The dedication a mom put into two hours every Saturday make a difference. 
she told us that it was something that happened when he joined the program and saw other kids going through his struggles that they could do it and the light bulb went you know on in his head and he said if they can do it i can do it too and that was the motivation he needed another child named brian was a teenage male who uh, had a renal transplant and was on daily prednisone and you know he, he also had hypertension and for the longest time people told him that because of his daily prednisone he couldn't lose weight but we on the chart here it shows his improvement in BMI after the program. And this is something that was shared with me after I left uh, Georgia and came to Illinois. I wanted to share that to show you the difference. These are just some pictures to uh, show you the exercise classes we had. It was group fitness. We also um, had donated like bikes during the time in the program. The kids got to ride bikes. We had a pool party to celebrate at the end. But this is the space we were donated one hour every Saturday and a fitness instructor that helped us. Dietitians and dietetic interns, as I said here, it's very interactive nutrition lessons that were provided. And then these are some pictures that showed um, the chef, Edward Mendoza. Um, he's actually a Cordon Bleu chef, and he actually was a chef that helped uh, private chef for many of the people at the, in the Dallas Cowboys when he used to live there. Um, I met him because his wife is a pediatric hematologist, oncologist at the hospital, and she volunteered his services to help our program. He opened his restaurant once every three months and shut it down for several hours just to provide the space for us to do our cooking classes. And he, he also owns several restaurants. He is a chef for the Masters Tournament for golf in Augusta every year. So we wonder, you know, for someone who is so successful, why would he do it? He said he wanted to give back and he wanted to make a difference. Uh, Wild Tree is a company that is international. And we had a rep there who also volunteered her time to make it make a difference. And a lot of her work carried on to here in Illinois as well, when she introduced me to other people that could help her uh, help me with uh, in relation to Wild Tree. We also, in January um, 2013, um, I organized a, a 5K called Fight Obesity, Walk With Me. And we invited children and community to create a design for the t-shirt, what it meant to be healthy. We combined the design with three children and had a medical illustrator at the, at the hospital put together the t-shirt. And we had over a hundred people come out on a cold January in 2013, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Day weekend, and we celebrated that. So, um, and then Derek is uh, pictured here with his mom. The The news came and interviewed him because of the success and the fact that he accomplished his first 5K, even though he couldn't walk a block when he started our program. So when I came here to Illinois, uh, to Rockford, Loves Park area in Illinois, and June 2013, um, lots of my partners in PSGI asked me, can you do an obesity program for Rockford, Loves Park, Illinois, like you did in Georgia? And I said, I think I can do it. And it gave me this idea of if I can replicate it like the AP grant said in any city, any state, then I can form a nonprofit. So November 6, 2014, I established my nonprofit called Faith Food of Fitness. And it is a nonprofit organization that serves as a liaison to assist in the development of community-based, stewardship-driven childhood obesity intervention programs across America. With the help of an attorney that I met in Georgia, we became a registered trademark on, in April of 2016. People often ask me why the name Faith Food of Fitness so faithful, committed, devoted, dedicated, loyal, just like our fitness journey, we may fail. It's a lifelong journey, but we try to get back on track. Two, the number two represents a partnership, you know, two things at a time, diet and exercise, the parent of the child, the doctor and the patient, people and community, physical, mental well-being, fitness. So it's not just about the weight is about focusing on overall health and wellness and fitness, mentally, spiritually, physically. So faithful to fitness. When I mentioned stewardship, 
Stewardship's defined about ownership of things, responsibility, accountability, and a reward. And it's broken down to time, talent, and treasure, which in you know, Christian faith, we're very familiar with that. We talk about that in terms of tithing and helping out with our churches. And our Faithful to Fitness program, nobody gets paid a penny to do anything. We are asking for the time, talent, and treasure of organizations and individuals to support our cause. So when I was asked to help out to start a program in Rockford, Illinois, I looked at the research and said, is this an area that needs my help? So according to the Gallup survey in 2011 that interviewed people 18 and older by telephone call, and it was self-reported BMI, uh, 190 U.S. metropolitan areas that were surveyed, and only those, they interviewed over 300,000 people, only those areas that had at least 300 interviews were included. And it showed that Rockford was the fourth most obese of 190 U.S. Metro metropolitan areas in the U.S. And they had a list of 2000, and in 2011, of the top 10 most obese and the top, the least obese, the 10 least obese. And they also showed that for, for people who lived in the top 10 most obese metropolitan areas, they had a higher percent lifetime increase of diabetes, heart attack, high blood pressure, depression, and high cholesterol. And the percentages are shown here. We also looked at the cost, in, incremental estimated costs of healthcare related to obesity and potential savings if only 10%, I'm sorry, I'm sorry if only 50% of the population were obese. So for Rockford, if only 15% of the population were obese, it would save over $100 million. So we are gonna save on healthcare costs. We can look at obesity as an area to focus on. So in Rockford, Illinois, these are community partners so there's a gym called Peak Sports Club that my husband and I are part of, and I approached the manager, and within 10 minutes, they said, absolutely, your vision is our vision. Whatever we can do, we will help you since 2015. Astute Web Group is a um, web design company that does all of our designs for our website, our t-shirts, our banners, our flyers, anything that we need. Phil Nicolosi Law um, has been our registered agent to keep us um, with our paperwork as a nonprofit. And Food for Fuel helps us with our cooking classes. Again, companies that Wild Tree and Epicure now is also a partner. So they provide spices and oils and freezer meals. Meyer in Rockford is our grocery store that provides us with gift cards. Angelic Organics Learning Center is a farm that we take kids to. So teach them how to see that food doesn't just come from a box, right? You know, how to grow vegetables, harvest them, how to make a salad, how to make a vinaigrette. And we have Bradford dietitians and nurses that come out and exercise with us, have medical students that do that as well, and also provide grocery store tours and nutrition lessons that are interactive. So since April 2015, we accept up to 20 children every 12 weeks, except we pause the program itself in 2020 because of the pandemic. Um, we have exercise classes at Peak Sports Club in Loves Park every Saturday for an hour. And it's a, it's a time to meet and motivate for families to look forward to as a group. We have food prep classes supported by Food for Field, Wild Tree, Epicure, and Meyer. And then we do grocery store tours about um, once every 12 weeks uh, that provides nutrition education. And we also provide an opportunity for families to see that they can eat healthy and it's not more expensive. And we give them a budget to shop, uh, shop during that hour and a half tour that we pay for. And we take the kids to the farm at Jalic Organics Learning Center. We have a farm instructor that goes through everything um, during that two hour tour. These are some pictures from Rockford, Illinois when we started in March of 2015 where I presented my proposal for Rockford, Illinois. These are some exercise classes that we've had, also swimming, dodgeball, group fitness, uh, just motivation and all of us can, you know, afford to get healthier, right? So even as healthcare providers, we have to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. These are meal prep classes that we've done. It's very hands-on. The kids love it. Parents love it. And they feel empowered because they, they are learning how to cook. 
these are grocery store tours and um, nutrition lessons. Again, my dietitians that volunteer for our cause. I also, um, we focus on our nutrition lessons on sugary beverages and rethink your drink, which is provided by the Illinois Alliance for Prevention of Obesity. This is uh, some pictures from the farm tours um, that we've done and where they learn how to prep vegetables and make a salad. They sit down, eat together, learn how to make a vinaigrette. People get hungry when I get to this part when I show these pictures. So, <laughs> so some highlights from our first 12 week program. So um, families reported eating more vegetables. They stopped drinking sugary, sugary beverages basically by the third week of our program because they're surrounded when they come to the classes, everybody's bringing water bottles. And they also take time to plan regular exercise together as a family, just as simple as walking together after dinner. Irritable bowel syndrome, constipation, reflux symptoms have significantly improved in many parents and children. Either they had weight loss or they had a stable body mass index for children. Many children with fatty liver disease had normal liver enzymes at the end of 12 weeks. There was one boy who had hypertension. By the end of 12 weeks in our program, mom came back and said, the doctor said for the first time his blood pressure is normal. And one mom who was pre-diabetic, she said that after 12 weeks, her doctor said she had a normal hemoglobin A1C. Six moms and two dads each lost 20 pounds at the end of 12 weeks. So even though we enrolled their children, we required them to be involved, they also improved as well. This is a card that we received from a family at the end of the first 12 weeks. And it really inspires me every time I look at this card. It says a ripple from a single stone cast into the waters touches small islands, distant shores. So too has your teaching. This is um, a, a child from the July, October 2015 program. She was interviewed by the Rockford Register Star newspaper, July 2nd, 2016. And she said that, she said this, I didn't like working out in groups. I wasn't ready for that. But I looked around and saw people going through the same struggles with weight and food. I was thankful I wasn't alone. And she lost 20 pounds over one year. She was honored as Rockford's Youth of the Year in 2016 by the Boys and Girls Club for commitment to leadership and community. What happened was when she applied for the award, she came to me and asked for a letter of recommendation. And I looked at what she's done and that's how we followed up. And the confidence that she had from a girl who was shy, didn't wanna be part of a group to being a leader in the community. So those are the impact that we had above and beyond just weight loss. Another child named Johnny had Hirschsprung's disease diagnosed soon after birth and had surgery following repeated, repeated bouts of enterocolitis. Um, he had reversal of anastomosis and had an ileostomy. He was evaluated by Boston Children Cleveland Clinic for a possible ostomy revision, but he couldn't have surgery until he lost weight. So mom had him, mom and him participate in our program October 2016 to January 17. And at the beginning, his weight was 189. At the end, it was 162. And mom said a text message to me that you'll never know how much you have helped us. And at that point, she said Colorado was doing his revision. So the impact on other health issues, not just weight. So um, I had a medical student who graduated um, medical school in 2018, currently a pediatrician in Illinois. He was part of the James Scholar Program, which um, accepts students that are the top 10% of the class. So in the James Scholar Program, the student has to identify a project and also a, a faculty mentor. So he volunteered for our program and he applied for the James Scholar, was accepted, and he approached me and said, can we design a project based on the participants in Faithful Fitness? So from April of 2016 to July 2017, we looked at the, the participants in our program and we had an IRB approval through the medical school. We had personal health identifiers that were removed and we had 100 people that were in the, in the program, but only 63 that qualified for a retrospective chart review for this study. And the, the qualifications was that they had to attend at least seven out of the 12 classes. So greater than 50% attendance. 
And we um, looked at factors, you know, whether, what was the thing that improved after the 12 weeks and beyond our program? So we looked at body mass index percentile, liver enzymes, hemoglobin A1C, total cholesterol and systolic blood pressure. And we found that although, um, for instance, like the lab data that we obtained were within three months before the program and also three months after the end of the program. And although the BMI percentile didn't change very much, all the other parameters improved significantly over the course of before and the end of the program. And um, we worked with a statistician and showed that these changes were statistically significant. And so although a lot of times we focus on just the weight, a lot of the metabolic parameters and other healthcare measures actually improve even before the weight and the body mass index changes. So this is something that you know we were able to contribute to this medical student who is now a doctor um, in terms of showing the, the, the importance of a program like Faithful Fitness and the nonprofit community involvement making a difference in childhood obesity. So what makes this model of obesity intervention unique? It emphasizes intervention for children, an opportunity for prevention, requires a parent and guardian involvement in all activities, it provides a support group for families who are struggling with obesity. Although we require a primary care physician referral, there's no insurance coverage that's needed. It's community-based. It's not in a clinic or a hospital. So it can be replicated anywhere. It's entirely volunteer-driven, and it's comprehensive. And again, it can be replicated in any community. So in the program that we've designed, children who are overweight or obese are referred. So far, we mainly work with children aged 7 to 18 years. Um, I've had a child as young as 5 um, who, had, who had parents involved in the program, and she did quite well in the group setting. But the age group is basic, basically the ability to kind of work in a group setting, much more productive than um, just bringing a child who needs to be you know, babysat on the side. Children and parents who are motivated to make lifestyle changes are included and accepted as program or having lack of access to physical activity. They have a desire for education and healthy nutrition. So if they already have a membership of a, at a gym and they're not going, they're probably not a good candidate for our program. Support from Faithful to Fitness. So children who complete at least 80% attendance of the program, so they get to miss like two, they get support for a three-month membership at peak. So far, we've given over 10 scholarships you know, from our program. And we also have support through Food for Fuel, the dietitian, Epicure, to access healthy nutrition and uh, freezer meal workshops. Um, once I had my program established after a year, I started creating a 5K event every August called Fight Obesity, Walk With Me. So we have the mayor, this is uh, Mayor Larry Morrissey from Loves Park involved. And every year, Mayor Greg Jury, who's current mayor, is involved. And every year we have more and more people, somewhere between 150 to 250 participants each year. It brings out the community and parents. It gives an opportunity for motivation because you can't just go one day sitting on the couch or running a 5K the next day. So it's preparation, walking for months on end and getting us prepared for that. And in 2018, my dad passed away and we used that opportunity to dedicate that year to my dad and opportunity for, to invite my family to contribute to our cause as well. This is 2019 where we also supported other causes related to obesity. We had this gentleman here named Ethan, he actually lost like half his body weight preparing for the Chicago Marathon. So I contributed personally to his cause and to his uh, marathon uh, fund, fundraising for obesity intervention. In 2020, in the middle of pandemic, we didn't have the program, we still had a 5K and we invited virtual walkers. So we had 10 other states that were participating in our 5K as well. And then in 2021, we had up to 222 registrants with 34 virtual walkers in five other states. In, in 2022, um, it was a very special year. 
uh, my mom actually passed away December 21. So we dedicated this year to my mom. And I think like through um, generosity, you also find ways to deal with grief. And I think that's very important to consider as well. So I wanted to share a mom and a son, uh, Yvette and Jaden, who spoke at our 2022 5K event. So mom said here, we have never seen or been in a program where a doctor and a dietitian and other volunteers, fitness instructors all exercise with us, helping us together as a family, motivating one another, helping us not to focus just on the scale, but our lifestyle change, to better our health, to increase our chances to live longer. And then for Jaden, the son, he shared this at his at the 5K. He said, I've been diagnosed, I have been in Faith Foot of Fitness for almost a year and has changed my life. After I've been diagnosed with diabetes for almost two years, my hemoglobin A1C started before the program at 9.9% and it dropped to 6.3%. And he was still working on towards the goal of making it under 5.7%. The best part is that I no longer need to inject myself all that insulin like I used to. So we got him off insulin after being in our program. So that was very impressive, and it was an inspiration for many people that attended our 5K event. I can get this here. Stuck out there. So our most recent um, 5K event was just this past August 19th. And we had a partner with Chick-fil-A. They actually came out and served a little uh, breakfast biscuits for people at the end of the program. So we wanted to highlight that partnership as well. <clears throat> I also, um, in September 2021, I began training as a professional speaker to just really help share the message of Faith for the Fitness better. And writing, and, you know, published a book and uh, called Live to Give and encouraging people to be more selfless using their time, talent, and treasure. And in there, I also share a chapter there about the divine intervention that brought many of the partners to make my vision of Faith Put of Fitness possible. Um, it's all volunteerism, as I encourage that every year. Um, I was invited by the Catholic Medical Association Dr. Dr. Podcast with Dr. Thomas McGovern to EWTN and shared childhood obesity Knowledge, Passion, Mission, and Faithful to Fitness. I wrote an article in Legatus International and a blog with uh, my Catholic doctor, Catholic Medical News and Views in 2021. And also in the secular um, healthcare setting, um, other opportunities with the YMCA, uh, the Driven Entrepreneur Podcast, uh, really teaching people that generosity also reduces stress and helps us through times like grief. And if you were interested in listening, listening to some of the podcasts and more, like I have it on my website, mdkatrina.com. So you can listen to that and share it with other people. I also established a memorial charity fund in honor of my dad in September 2021 on the feast day of St. Vincent de Paul. And uh, I found that, you know, we don't really need big grants that determine how we support people with the money. We can use our own ways to fund um, our, our mission, our passion. And this is why I, I did this as well. And I'm doing the same thing for my mom shortly. So how can you help us fight childhood obesity? Share our, our mission, our Facebook page, spread the word about our mission. You can educate and also be an advocate for obesity intervention programs in your community. You could be a volunteer, inspire other volunteers, invite other volunteers like chefs, cooks, gyms, fitness instructors, grocery stores, dietitians, medical students, physicians, and nurses. Support businesses that promote, promote healthy lifestyles and donate to causes like ours or even in your own community if you start your own program. Our ultimate goal is to establish chapters of Faith to Fitness in other cities and states and have a walk to Fight Obesity Walk With Me event in each year in other cities and states. And this year, earlier this year, I was able to meet um, through speaking. I met uh, a business mentor who will help me with this uh, goal over the next couple of years. So it'll be something that we'll see come to, to vision. These are some acknowledgments of attorneys that I mentioned, Phil Nicolosi as our registered agent. Uh, Kilpatrick Townsend, attorney in Georgia, who has helped me with the, the uh, 
trademark and they represent us pro bono and the website company as do web group. I also wanted to acknowledge uh, my uncle who passed away in 2012. He was an orphan after the Vietnam War and he was never married and had no children. And after he passed away, we found out that he created a trust and the trust is focused on supporting charitable causes related to education, poverty, and for children. So the trust is called Avocado Trust because he had an avocado tree in his backyard. And so he's like, I'm gonna just name it Avocado Trust. So we honored him um, by creating this statement on his tombstone, a lifetime of simplicity and a legacy of generosity. So his trust has supported uh, Faithful to Fitness and many, many other causes every December over 20 different charities every year supported by his trust. And that's really his trust and his formation of trust is what inspired me to start with forming memorial trust and charity funds in honor of my parents while I'm alive to make a difference currently, not just in the future. And finally, with all the work that we all do, and when I serve as a physician and my nonprofit work, one of my favorite saints and my favorite humanitarian is St. Teresa of Calcutta. And I'm always reminded of this. I am a little pencil in the hand of a writing God who is sending a love letter to the world. Thank you.